we'll mention Brownsville was the first book I wrote uh, back in 2008. So 10 years ago, I was working on this book. And we have come such a long way as an industry. And yet, in so many ways, we haven't come very far. I was speaking with some people at breakfast this morning, and we were just reminiscing about just how much more organizations do know. And yet, at the same time, because they do know so much more, so many people more engaged, at the same time, they think they're not necessarily the ones who have to do this. So that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book, The Engaged Leader. Because so many times now, our leaders are standing on the sidelines and waving us onwards. They're the ones at the, on, the, on the sidelines saying, this, this is great, go be digital, go be social. But when it comes to them doing this, they don't do it. So I recognize the fact that I am speaking in many ways to my colleagues, to my peers here who are actively engaged in using social, promoting its work in the, in the industry, in the company. And so this presentation is for you to use and embrace and how you can become a better engaged leader as well. But it's also, I'm speaking to you who also have to speak to your leaders, your executives. And what are the things that you can take back to them to help them be the best leaders that they can be? So I wanna to talk today, first of all, with us, with you. Think about the best leader you've ever had the privilege to work with. Think about who that person is. It could be your first boss. It could have been a coach, a teacher. It could be your, your current leader that you're working with. Think about that person. Have their face in your mind. And now think about how they made you feel. Encapsulate that feeling into a single word. And I'd love you to share that word with me. Anybody want to share the word? Motivated. Motivated. Great one. Inspiring. Inspiring. Welcome. Welcomed. Trust, Massimo, capable, any others? Valued. These are really powerful words. And the reason why they're so powerful is that leadership has been one thing through all of the ages, and it still continues to be the same today. Leadership is simply this. It's simply a relationship. It's a relationship between people who aspire to lead and those who choose and are inspired by them to follow them. And what's interesting about leadership today is that it's no longer tied to a specific title or a position. It is something that lives inside of you. It is something that you decide to take on that mantle of leadership. It's not something necessarily given to you anymore. Just look at how many people follow people on social, on Twitter, on Instagram. These are people who are leading conversation, leading where your brand is going, leading where your company is going. So what does leadership look like then in this day and age? And especially because it's so disruptive, we need more leaders who can lead us in a very uncertain disruptive times. And I think in particular in disruptive times, we need leaders who can drive movements. And I love this picture because as Martin Luther King on his I dream uh, I have a dream speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And he's standing there in front of 250,000 people, expecting that only 100,000 people would show up. But it wasn't the people in the, in the audience that really, that he was playing to. There were, for the first time, TV cameras also. And he recognized, and the leaders of that movement recognized, that they were playing to a larger audience. And they needed to harness and engage people through this new medium called television. So they're discovering what does it mean to be a leader in this new technology, in this new age? And more importantly, how do we create a movement of disruption that results in growth and change like the civil rights? And if you are an audacious company with audacious goals and audacious beliefs and objectives, how do you create that disruption that drives growth? And I think you need a different type of leader, one that is going to create a movement. And the only way you can do that is to be truly engaged. And so what does it mean to be an engaged leader? I have this definition, um, it's from the book. It's from somebody who knows how to use all of these tools, can harness them in digital, and mobile, and social in a way that's very strategic. Strategic meaning what you will do, but just as importantly, what you won't do in order to accomplish their goals. So I'm not asking leaders to just jump onto Twitter 
or to be on Facebook. I'm not asking them to do any of those things. I'm asking them to think, how can I extend my leadership through these channels? Be a better leader, be more engaged, because the way that we create relationships now is no longer, you know, you know come shake my hand. You know, this is great, right? We can shake our hands and look each other in the eye, and we have an issue, we can resolve it, we can say, we're good, right? We're good. There's a value to being here in this room. But at the same time, how do we do this across time and space? And we as leaders now need to be able to look across distances, across time zones and geographic locations, and to be able to know that we're good. So a great example of a person who does this is Ginny Romney. One of the things she does, well, actually she doesn't do, is tweet. She has an account, Ginny Romney, but she never uses it or at least she never posts onto it. She and her team use it constantly to listen to what the conversations are, to participate in this channel. And I had a chance to talk to her and ask, why don't you use Twitter? And she said, well, I took a look at all the things I can do against my agenda and decided that Twitter wasn't a place where I could be authentic, where I could be true. I could be transparent. I could really achieve my leadership agenda. So I have chosen not to use it as a place where I share and engage, but I use it a lot to listen. I'm constantly listening to what people are saying to me. And I use my other channels. I use video. I use LinkedIn. I use blog posts. I use discussion forums, especially internally, to be able to engage with people. So is she an engaged leader? Absolutely but not necessarily through every channel. She has chosen strategically what she will do and to use. So the framework I have to be able to think about this is pretty simple. And, but one of the things I wanted to explore was understand in terms of developing a framework, what is it that keeps so many leaders from being digital in the first place? And you may have heard these excuses or even used them yourself. So the first one is I simply do not have the time. I do not have time to post out there 18 times a day, to be engaging and answering all the questions. And I go back to, do you have time to just listen to the most important constituents that you have? Are your employees, your customers, your channel partners, your suppliers, are these people important to you? Well, they're out there, they're talking, are you listening? It's as if they're calling you on the phone and knocking on the door and you don't have the time to answer them. How could you say you don't have the time? You absolutely must make time. Another excuse that I hear oftentimes is, who cares what I had for lunch? I, I agree with them. <laughs> I really don't care what you had for lunch as an executive. What I really do care about, though, is what you talked about over lunch. What did you share? What did you say? What's on your mind? What do you think we're doing well? Where do you think we need to improve? What are customers saying to us? What are you hearing? I want to know from you, our leader, what's going on. So it's important to share, but share about the important things that are important to your leadership agenda. I love this one, especially sitting where you are. It's, it's marketing's job. It's not my job as a leader to do this. I had a great conversation with Jeffrey Imelt, the CEO of GE, back in 2010. And he, I was speaking with him and a group of their up-and-coming women leaders. And my job was to do a workshop with them on how they could be more digital, more social. And we're having dinner, and we're talking about this. And it suddenly dawned on me that Jeff himself wasn't doing any of this. So I turned to him, and I go, Jeffrey, what about you? How come you're not being more digital, more social, more engaged? And he goes, oh, it's, it's, it's not my job. That's Beth Comstock's job. She's a CMO. And the minute he said that, he realized, that's not right. I'm asking these leaders to be digital. I need to be digital, too, as well. I need to figure out what does it mean to be a leader in this space. So he started that journey. He started blogging internally, externally. He's now on LinkedIn. He tweets all the time. Like, maybe not all the time, but times again when he feels it's important to make his presence known, to extend again his leadership. So this is a job of every leader to establish what that relationship looks like, how to be engaged. 
So, and I think this is the one that I hear most often from people, that I just simply don't want to get in trouble. I don't know what I can do, can't do, so I'm just not going to do any of it. But the reality is, leadership is an act of courage. It requires you to go out there and know what you can and can't do and, and have the ability to push that agenda forward. Because otherwise, why are you being asked to be a leader if it was easy? But I'd also say to many leaders, you know what you can and can't do. Now it's trying to figure out and have the confidence to do that inside of these new channels. So the way I think to be able to do this are the three things. Simple things. One, listen at scale. Two, share the shape. And three, engage to transform. So we're going to go through each of these areas. And also I want to be able to just, I wanted to keep it a really easy framework because executives need something easy, as we heard earlier today. It's not about making it complicated, is how do we make this easy for them to understand and how it extends to things that they do every day. Let's talk about listening first. There's a great quote from 2,000 years ago from the great philosopher Epictetus, and he says, we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen in the, as much, twice as much as we speak. And that hasn't changed. Fun, the foundations of great leadership is that you listen and you listen really well. We're at a conference that talks about listening. And yet, when I talk to so many executives, they have no idea what's going on. And why is that? It should be at their fingertips. The tools that are available, as we heard from this last panel, can be put into the hands of every single person. And especially for the executives and fine-tuned to the things that they care about. So how can we make that happen? Here's an example. Uh, this is from Red Robin, and one of the things they did is they set up a system for their employees to be able to share information with each other. And so they had the listening externally to the customers, but customers were sometimes a little bit slow in getting back information, but the employees, you could hear from them immediately if something was wrong. And the servers in particular started noting, you know, we have this new burger, the Pig Out Double Tavern Burger, and it's not working well. In fact, the customers really don't like it. They're sending it back, and we're having problems trying to make this item work. Looks great, sounds appealing, but the bacon's soggy, the aioli sauce makes everything slippery and it falls apart in people's laps. It's a mess. And what was interesting, the executives had this inside of their dashboard to be listening to those employees. And so they could hear the voice of the customer through the employees, also see it next aside to the customers, and were able to do something about this. They went immediately into their kitchens at headquarters, talked to some of those employees, asked them to come in and also provide feedback into that process, and in 30 days had a new recipe out into the field. Just to give you some context, it normally took them 12 to 18 months to get something out. But because of this accelerated listening, being able to listen at scale, they were able to make it in just 30 days. That's tr tremendous impact on what happens inside of an organization. This is no longer something that's outside, something that's esoteric, something that doesn't necessarily impact the company. It's at the core of what the company is doing. And so a couple things that I encourage uh, you to think about and to encourage you for yourself and also for your team and for your leaders, find 15 minutes a day. Schedule it if you need to. Put it on the mobile phones of the people who need to listen better and make it something that becomes part of their day. Teach them how to use it in their interstitial time, the time spent waiting in line for coffee, for example. And how do you leverage those seconds, those times to be able to tap into the screen and make it work for them. So let's talk about the next area, which is sharing to shape. What I mean by sharing, it's really about this new idea that has been around for a long time, but we could never really do it very well. The problem is that sharing used to be very hard. It used to be very scarce because of the way technology and media worked. So we had to be perfect. We had to keep it episodic. And we had to be really perfect at everything that we did. But now because sharing is so much easier, it's an abundance, we have to think very differently. But the reality is we as business people, we as leaders and executives have been told our entire professional lives, do not share. It's dangerous. You'll get in trouble. You're going to, have putting your, you're going to be putting your reputation on the line. So don't do it. And yet we find just the opposite. 
It's in the sharing that relationships are created. It's in the sharing that we grow and develop and deepen those relationships that are so important to our leadership agendas. So let me give you an example of one woman who did this. Uh, this is Rosemary Turner. She is a regional manager at UPS in Northern California, and she manages uh, a small town, basically. It's 17,000 people. They're in the warehouses. They drive trucks all over the Bay Area. And her biggest problem is that she wanted people to feel comfortable, that if they ever had a problem, that she was no longer just a name on a call list or an org chart, that she had a name, a face, she had a personality, and she really deeply cared about them. She wanted them to be able to knock on her door and say, Rosemary, I got something I don't talk to you about. And so she started using Twitter. She actually called it the Twitter. She didn't know quite how to think about it. She goes, I'm not a spring chicken by any means. She goes, I, I, I don't know how to use the Twitter. Can somebody show me? And so she started going out there and just posting up stories, posting up pictures. And take a, take a look at this picture, right? It, it's backlit, it's blurry, it's not a great picture, but it spoke volumes about who is Rosemary, who does she care about. She po she's posing here with a mechanic who probably got the safety award, and she's celebrating him. And his buddies were cheering him on. Other people could see her from that region and that hub. And they were like, wait, Rosemary, there she is. And she's tweeting out, stay away from AT&T Park as the Giants are winning today. Go Giants. So she's talking to people, having conversations with them. She's sharing with them information and a little bit about herself. And one day, she knew that her strategy was working because a 20-something driver came up to her door, knocked on it, and said, Rosemary, there's something I need to talk to you about. She knew that that relationship was starting to change because she could see it and people reaching out to her and seeing that relationship develop in new and different ways. Here's another example uh, from Marriott. This is Bill Marriott Sr. He's the executive chairman of Marriott. And he's like in his mid-80s. He doesn't know how to type, and he blogs all the time. Now, for, for these executives who say to me, I just don't get out and know how to use these, you know, these tools. They're too hard. Now, that doesn't stand in the way of Bill Marriott. He goes, I've got a story to tell. I got a story to tell that's going to shape the relationships. In this blog post, he's writing about the Model T that his parents drove from, Washington, DC, from Salt Lake City to Washington, DC. And they recently got a Model T into the building, the headquarters. And he's talking about how he's excited and it brought back memories about the, uh, the, the level of service that his parents wanted to have. No one else can tell this story other than Bill Marriott. And he's telling it here. He sometimes dictates it, he sometimes writes it out in long form. He has people who help him get it up there, but that, again, is not going to stand in his way of a great story. So when I talk to executives, they go, what do I say? What do I put out there? What do I share? I ask them this, what's your story? What's the story that you're going to tell that's going to drive people to action? What's the story you can tell that will help me get people to understand what the agenda is, get them focused on what our purpose and mission, what are we trying to accomplish? Stories are wonderful because they're memorable, they're emotional, and most importantly, they're shareable. This is the foundations, again, for how do you create a movement? The movement spreads, stories spread, and engagement has to spread, too, as well. So let's talk about the last area, which is around engagement. Engagement is where you actually transform that relationship from something that was OK before to something that could be potentially great. So here's a story from uh, David Thotty. He's a CEO, just retired from Telstra, Australian company, telecom company, the largest in Australia. And they had a big problem in that they had to change over their entire infrastructure over the course of four years. And it was such a bad situation in terms of the service that new employees coming into Telstra wouldn't admit that they worked there. So you'd be at a barbecue, and somebody come up to you as a, Telstra, as, a, as a friend and go, wait a minute, you work at Telstra. I heard you just took a job there. My phone service is horrible. What are you going to do about this? And the friend would say, I, not me. I, I don't work there. So this is not a good situation. And so David realized that in order to change 
the strategy of the company to create a better customer experience, he had to change the employee experience. How was he going to lead them through this transformation? So he started posting internally. Again, a nice, safe place. It's a little bit hard to read, so I'll read it to you. He posted on, on in this internal social network team. Please share your top 10 processes or approvals that are a time waster, things that just aren't needed. And we will either get rid of them or explain why we have them. Looking forward to what you have to share. What do you think happened? Well, if you look at the bottom of this post, it says 832 older replies. 700 of those came within the first hour. These were like really pent up demands from people. And one of the most interesting things is what happened afterwards. David and his executive team didn't go off into some boardroom and discuss what should, do, what should happen. They came right back into this post. The next 132 replies are from them, explaining which of those processes they're going to keep and explaining which ones they were going to get rid of. How do you think, how do you think those employees now felt about their leaders? They felt empowered, valued, listened to. Those words that you heard at the very beginning, they didn't have those words when we began. So this is what David was looking for. He was looking for this opportunity to be able to change the relationship with employees and in the process change the relationship with customers. About a year and a half after he started this, they launched a new app on the phone that they gave to uh, their employees. It was a mobile app called the Barbecue App. So if you're now at that barbecue or family gathering, your friends and family, when somebody comes up to you and goes, hey, wait a minute, you work at Telstra. My service is awful. What are you going to do about it? They now can take out their phone and say, I will log you into our special program here. I'm going to connect you with a premium service desk. And we will have a three-way conversation until you are completely 100% satisfied. This is engagement at the very highest levels of the organization, but also asking each and every single person inside the organization to be a leader themselves, to be engaged themselves, to be able to transform that relationship with that customer who is a friend or family member. And if it begins with that, that's where the transformation happens. That's where the movement begins to build. What I find so interesting about this is that it wasn't something really drastic. It was common sense. It says that we put our customers at the center. We create customer obsession across the entire organization. And where that customer experience strategy started from was at the very top of the organization. It wasn't just somebody who's in charge of customer experience or somebody in charge of social. This is the entire executive team understanding the power of connection and relationships and the role that digital, mobile, and social tools have in developing those relationships. So these are the three things. How do you listen? How do you share? How do you engage? Those three things, so simple, but yet so powerful as a way to begin that relationship. I'm going to just close up with a couple of final thoughts before we take some questions, hopefully, from, from the audience about this. But I think in many ways, in all the research that I do, the hardest part about leadership is courage. And the hard part about this is that it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like something that I know everything that's going on. And I often sometimes say to executives, you know you're doing it right when your palms are sweaty and your stomach is churning. I know I am doing it right. I'm sticking my neck out because that's when I'm doing my best work as a leader. I sweat it out to this very day every time I post something on social. Everything, every single tweet, every single post, every picture, every book and report that I write, my palms are sweating. And I know I'm doing it right because I'm pushing the edges of what I can be capable of doing. And at the same time, you got to have a lot of confidence. And this is the interesting part. Because confidence is when I know I am aiming for the right objectives. I know my purpose and mission. I know what I'm fighting for, where I need that courage to look over that precipice. And at the same time, you've got to combine that confidence with humility, a tremendous sense of humility to say, I don't have all of the answers. And the leaders that I study and I follow and that I continue to just admire are the ones who have this very interesting combination because it's that confidence, humility, and the courage that allows them 
to go and engage, to listen and to share. So I just want to end up with um, this, this theme again, that it's about relationships. I know we're here at a conference around technology, and the technology enables so much of this, but the technologies will come and go. You'll hear a lot of amazing things later today at 4 o'clock, as Will has promised. I saw a, a couple previews outside. But at the core of this, think about how you're going to use these technologies to deepen those relationships. How can you harness them and bring them into all parts of your organization? One final story I want to share. When I began my career in business, I actually was planning to go into medicine, and I grew up in Detroit. Um, and Asian American women in Detroit is not something you find very often. And when I shared with my family that I wanted to do this, they, they were kind of concerned that I wanted to go into business. They go, well, nobody looks like you. I mean, how are you going to be able to go out there and do this? And I went, I don't know any, I had no role models. I had nobody in business, nobody definitely writing books who looked like me. And in so many ways, though, because I was different from day one, because there was nobody else who looked like me in my community, in my schools. I said, if I'm going to be different, let's be really different. Let's go out there and create a disruption that we could never have seen before. But it took that one initial moment that first initial moment to say, I'm going to step out onto that ledge. I'm going to look on the other side. I don't know what's on the other side of that precipice, but I'm going to step into it anyways. In many ways, that's what gives me the courage today to continue on this journey. And I hope that for you, as you begin and continue the journey with your team and your executives, that you will find that courage to find that voice. It's never easy. It's never going to be clear. And yet the journey that you embark on is so worth it because you know what the objective is going to be at the end. So this is my contact information. I'm happy to send you these slides. I'm perfectly happy sharing those if you just want to email them to me. Um, and please stay in touch. I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a dialogue and a relationship. I, I put my contact information at the end of every single one of my speeches, and almost nobody ever reaches out to me. So I hope that's different with this group because this is a social group. Now, we are kind of on the same journey together. So with that, I just want to open up for any questions that you might have about these materials. Um, I'm also working on a lot of research from customer experience to my new book on disruption strategy, but I'm happy, I kind of call it Jeopardy Hour for an analyst. So any questions that you have? And there are mics running around. Just raise your hand really high. Got one up here, back there. You're the one with the mic? I'll, I'll okay, great. Off, Shani, I, I, uh, I want to say, Thank you for the presentation. I love your, the way that you present. It's so engaging. It was so easy to listen to. Oh, great. Thank um, you. So uh, I guess my question is, um, uh, you, you're around your theme of, um, of leadership. One of the things that you did is you kind of zoomed up, up and down a little bit and talking about leadership from what would be traditionally non-leaders to leaders in a kind of role sort of place. How do, you, how, do, how do you think about connecting inside the organization? Because, um, you know, like I said earlier on, we've got 360-odd staff. Uh, and one of the things I'm struggling with is actually how do I scale up my ability to interact with people across the organization? Um, I don't know everybody's name any longer, which is an embarrassment to me, but uh, it, it is a thing. So as a, as a, as, as a leader of this company, I'm, I'm looking for anything that I can I can do to improve the way that I can be more engaged within the organization. What, what, have you seen things that other people do? Yeah, um, again, I kind of pointed out to what David thought he was doing with an internal social network. They happen to be using a, a version of Yammer, but you could use Yammer, Chatter, Facebook, work. it doesn't matter. You could use discussion boards for all I care. It's about how you use them. And what David discovered was that when real work got done in these environments, real work, and the executives were stepping into it every single day. He would get up in the morning, and he would scroll through on his iPad while literally drinking his coffee. He'd be on his mobile phone while getting more, he drank a lot of coffee, getting more coffee, right? And he would just walk up to people like, so what do you think about what's happening in Adelaide? And the executive going, I have no idea what's happening in Adelaide. He goes, well, it's all over the stream. How come you're not on the stream? So it was him. And I was talking to his COO, and his CEO, poor CEO was like, he's driving me crazy. 
right? He's, I never know what he's going to come up to me and ask me about, because it's all over the stream. So when real work gets done, because the executives show up, that's when the magic happens. But executives, I see this over and over again. I got asked to come into one of these unicorn companies in Silicon Valley. Well, not disclose who that person, that company is. But they were, I was sitting there talking to the 15-member executive team. And I go, so you're having problems with your install of your internal social network. What's going on? Well, what was the last time you guys posted something on it? What, was you, what were your discussions? Awkward silence. None of them been on it. And the only person who had been on it was the administrator. And he had only been on it a week ago. So none of them were using it. So how can it be effective? If you do not show up as an executive team, if your executives aren't engaged and at least listening and then using it in their conversations, then it's not going to happen. Cool. I'm going to help, I'm going to help point out people. So we had another question, Tim, and then we'll take a couple more, and then we're going to... Okay. Great. I was going to ask about the, uh, kind of the opposite situation where you have the too engaged leader, leader and how do you kind of <laughs> manage that? And, <laughs> or just a good anecdote from that situation? Well, we have a certain person in the White House who I would love to be yeah, able to take that, that one away. Um, I go back to discipline. I believe that leadership is a disciplined act, that you have between three and five objectives, and I say you, you can't have more objectives than you have fingers, right? Because you can't remember what they are, and people can't remember what they are, and you're diffusing it. So if your activity isn't geared towards one of those objectives that you have, then why are you doing this? you should stop. I've gone into organizations and stopped all of their social activities, put it all on the ice, because they had no idea why they were doing it. The agency was posting out internally, they were posting lots of pictures, it was a complete mess, the audience had no idea why they were doing it, and the leaders were just making it worse. So I'm like, stop it, get some discipline, get a strategy in place. Okay. Cool, one more question? Who would like to ask something of Charlene? No. Okay, okay, good. Well, we have Charlene's contact details, which is very kind and yes. generous. Can we have a massive round of applause for Charlene? Thank you.